All right. So tonight we're fortunate to have Dr. Jennifer Ackerfield speaking to us. If you were at last year's rare plant conference, you heard uh, Jennifer speak about thistles of Utah and her efforts to uh, reclassify the thistles of Utah. She received one of those grants uh, that I just talked about or that Kathy just talked about um, from Utah Native Plant Society. That was a small portion of, of the funding that she used to, uh, to do some of the work that she's done to classify, reclassify the thistles of Utah. And so I think that would support the work, some of the work you're talking about tonight. Right, Jennifer? Yes. Cool. Um, so Jennifer is the head curator of the Natural History Collections and Associate Director of Bi Biodiversity Research at the Denver Botanic Gardens. And she's an expert in botany. She's, uh, what's the name of your book? The Flora of Colorado is a book that she authored in 2015. Um, thistles and, and Circium are a, a favorite of hers and she's an expert in thistles. So we're really happy to have Ke uh, Jennifer here to talk to us tonight. And we'll turn it over to you, Jennifer. All right, thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, so many of you showed up to hear about thistles, which is very exciting. Cody Wallace. Yeah. Um, I am gonna start sharing my screen here. Hold on one second. Always takes a bit, and there we go. All right. So uh, if you tuned in to my presentation on the, the rare thistles of Colorado, I'm gonna be giving some updates on that and also just kind of expanding a little bit of the knowledge and kind of taking you on a, a little bit of a, a tour as well. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about all of the thistles in Utah, so I'll highlight some of my favorites too. All right, so just to kind of take a little step back before I get into the thistles, I, I kind of want to put us, um, you know, where we are in taxonomy. So thistles are a member of the Asteraceae or the Compositae family, the sunflower family. Uh, this is one of the most species families uh, on the planet. Lots and lots of members in the Asteraceae family, and they're really, really diverse. Okay, but they're all united by this one shared feature uh, called a capitulum or a head. So we have many flowers that are grouped together and uh, surrounded by these involucra of bracts. So we have a composite of many flowers together, hence the uh, family name of Composity. Oh, come on, there we go. So here is a typical thistle, right? We've got um, a receptacle, we've got our bracts, uh, we've got disc flowers in here. And one thing that you might hear me mention are white glutinous dorsal ridges. And I just kind of want to point out what those are. Um, when a thistle is fresh, it's actually really easy to see that glutinous dorsal ridge. If it's present, it's white. When they dry, they turn this kind of black or brown color, which makes it a little harder to tell. Um, but that's what that is in case you're ever going through the key and you're like, what's that white glutinous dorsal ridge? There it is. All right, and here's a typical uh, flower within that, at, um, within that cerceum head, okay? So we have one disc floret here, we have the pappus, and then here are the corolla lobes, and here's the corolla throat. Okay, so now we're all, we're all on the same page. We know where the thistles are. Now let's get into the Utah thistles. Okay, so uh, Utah's thistles, are really quite fascinating. Um, there are currently about 23 species of thistles recognized for Utah. And I say about 23 because it really depends on the source and the taxonomic delimitations that, that we're going to use. So about 23 is, is about what I'm gonna say today. Uh, two of those are uh, listed as rare, um, Circium ONBI, which we'll see, and Circium virginensi, which we'll see. And there are actually only two introduced thistles, uh, Canada thistle and bull thistle. So the uh, Flora of Utah, Stanley Welsh, uh, co-author, uh, has this really wonderful quote that I, that I love for the thistles of Utah. 
the thistles of Utah have long constituted one of the most difficult problems in the plant taxonomy of the state. And it is that way for a variety of reasons. Um, they are difficult to really discern the morphology on a herbarium specimen. Um, there's undescribed species. Uh, it just, there's a variety of different factors that really play into why the thistles of Utah are one of the most, uh, most taxonomically problematic groups. And so for my PhD, what I did was I, I really wanted to look at the across North America and try and sort out the taxonomy of some of these uh, species complexes. And so I did some work um, on the thistles of Utah, but as you'll see today, there are more questions that still need answered. Uh, Canada thistle. Canada thistle's awful. Uh, it gives all thistles a bad name, in fact. It, it kind of it stinks. Um, and in fact, uh, a lot of people, when they see Canada thistle and then they see a native thistle, think, oh man, there's, a, there's that Canada thistle again. I better get rid of that. And they end up destroying these native thistles. And it's really sad. Um, the thistles are actually really important. You know, they provide uh, pollen, pollinate, or their food for pollinators, food for pica. All right, let's move on. We're going to define a species. Okay. So, you know, this is something uh, that I, I always like to say uh, forms the basis of basically all biology, the definition of a species, but it is a little bit of a squishy concept when it comes to plants. Um, but it is super important because really effective conservation uh, comes down to accurate taxonomic classification. So we can't protect what we don't know is out there, right? So really, in essence, uh, the way I like to present it is that each species name is really just a hypothesis waiting to be tested. Okay, we're going to test it with genetic evidence, morphological evidence, um, geographic evidence, ecological evidence, and all of these um, lines of evidence combined will help us decide what we're going to call a species in essence. So the very first um, species that I want to talk about uh, used to be part of the Circium etonii varietal complex uh, called mountaintop thistle. Um, there were seven varieties that uh, were kind of put forth in the flora of North America. I've highlighted the varieties that I'll be talking about here uh, that are present in Utah. Well, this one might be present, variety viperinum. Um, there we go. So, for those of you who have never seen a phylogeny, this, this is a phylogeny basically showing the relationships of all of these different species to one another. And this is based on genetic data. Okay, so this is based on, on DNA uh, base pairs. So basically what this uh, phylogeny shows in relation to these different varieties that are in the Circium etonii varietal complex is that this this species, as it stands in the floor of North America, really isn't a single species because we have really uh, multiple different evolutionary lineages. Um, and even within one different variety here, like we have four different evolutionary lineages. So this is really a mess. Okay, so this was really fun to sort out. Um, so what I did was I then looked at, you know, the type um, specimens. I looked at original descriptions and I tried to pair them up as best as I could. And so the very first one I started with, of course, is Circium etonii. And for those of you in Salt Lake City, if you've been up in the mountaintops um, outside of Salt Lake City, you've probably seen Circium etonii. It's pretty, pretty common up there. And that's where the type specimen is from. It's right outside Salt Lake City here. So that's now the only place that Circium etonii grows. Okay, it is not found in Colorado. It's not found in Wyoming. It may actually be found in Nevada. The, we're a little, a little out on that, but, but it probably is not. All right, and there it is. Now here's a really fun one that I was uh, not expecting. So I sampled from across the geographic range of each of these varieties. And one of those that I sampled was this uh, variety, 
Parasonii, only found in the Tushar Mountains down here in southern Utah. And it is actually a distinct uh, lineage from Circium etonii. So I propose treating it as Circium harrisonii. So this is now a new endemic thistle to the Tushar Mountains of Utah. And this is um, a mountain range that has other endemic species. So it kind of, it kind of makes sense. Uh, it is morphologically distinguishable with these really dark involucral bracts here. Uh, this is one that I still have yet to see in the field. And in fact, this is one that there really is no photograph, at least one that I can find uh, online. This is one that I pulled off of iNaturalist. It is probably Parasonii, but I, I can't tell the photograph isn't the best quality. So, so we need a photo. All right. Now the other one in Utah, variety Murdochii, um, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, variety Utonii and variety Murdochii, you know, those are part of the same species, but they're actually not. They're actually two distinct evolutionary lineages. And so uh, what you've been calling variety uh, Circium Utonii, variety Murdochii in Utah is actually going to be elevated uh, back to Circium Murdochii. And so Circium Murdochii does not occur up here in Idaho. It does not occur in Montana. That's actually another species altogether. Okay. So Circium Murdochii is now uh, only found in Utah, right there in the northeast corner. And when you compare Circium Murdochii, which is here on the left, and Circium Etonii on the right, it's really clear that there actually are um, some very distinct morphological differences. Uh, in particular, with these involucral bracts, we have these really densely woolly bracts um, in Murdochii and not in Etonii. So these have basically almost no hairs. All right, what about that uh, Viperinum? Um, so David Keel described that from one mountaintop here in Nevada. Uh, what I found is, yes, it is another distinct evolutionary lineage. We're going to treat those as Circium viperinum, but the closest population here occurs very close to the Utah border, and it's one that I suspect could be present uh, in mountains um, along the border here in Utah as well. And there it is. All right. Now this one, uh, variety areocephalum posed one of the, the biggest taxonomic problems to sort out because when I did the genetic analysis, the phylogeny uh, clearly showed that we had four distinct evolutionary lineages that were all attributable to this one variety. So clearly there's, there's a lot going on here. Now, the only one that I'm going to talk about is the one that occurs here in Utah, this one down here in the corner. All right. Because that one from the LaSalle Mountains of Utah, long classified as Circium scopulorum, long classified as Circium etonii variety areocephalum, is actually a distinct evolutionary lineage, clearly very distinct morphologically. Uh, clearly has a distinct geographic range. It is a new species. And um, I had the, the pleasure of going out to Utah this last summer to collect type specimens um, of this species in the LaSalle Mountains. And Mark took me on this wonderful trek up the mountains, up to Mount Tuck. We saw uh, the thistle. Uh, he said that it was the most thistle he'd ever seen in that area and that they must have all come out for me. So it was, it was a real treat. And there it is. I, I took a lot of photos. So you have to see these. There it is. And it is quite tall or it can get quite tall. Um, I am almost six feet tall. So this, this is a really tall thistle. And the bees absolutely loved it. Uh, the, the flowers were just, just visited by bees over and over again. So it was it was a true delight to, to go see this in person. I think a lot of times, you know, we discover these new species based on genetic 
uh, data or maybe some morphological differences from a herbarium specimen. And a lot of times people don't get to go visit these new species in person. So it was, it was really nice. And this is one that, that I actually still do not have a name for. Um, I'm working on the description right now, but I still need a name. And I really want the name to honor the legacy of uh, the indigenous tribes that were in that area, in particular the youth. Now, for those of you going, well, this is clearly not Circeum scopularum. If you know Circeum scopularum, that, that's not Circeum scopularum. Why, why did no one think that this was a new species for so long? Uh, well, in part, it's because of this letter right here. So uh, Thistle, uh, kind of expert back in the day, uh, R.J. Moore, sent this little sample to Arthur Cronquist. And all he had was a, a description along with this head and, and one leaf. And he said, I don't know, can you tell me what this is? And Arthur Cronquist said, hey, well, I think, I think it might, might correspond to Rydberg's whatever that, that I'm now calling uh, Circeum scopularum. And that's how Circeum scopularum, the name, became adhered to these plants. Um, but Cronquist did, did say it may represent a, a new species, basically in the last paragraph of his letter. But with, with just a head and a leaf to go on, I, I could see why he was really hesitant to say, yes, this is a new species. Now, this is one that Mark and I did see some evidence of people um, trying to, to do some, quote, good and rid the world of these invasive thistles. Um, and it just is really sad because uh, these are not invasive thistles at all. So now here's where the mystery kind of deepens though. So we have this new species from the LaSalle Mountains, but there's this other specimen from the LaSalle Mountains um, from the top of uh, Mount Mel Melanthin and Barb Smith, uh, she sent me this photo last summer, and it is clearly also very distinctive and uh, different from the LaSalle thistle that I just showed you. So I do not know what this thistle is. There's another specimen from Mount Laurel. And so the, the mystery uh, thickens a little here. Um, I'm still not sure what to call these. Are they Circeum hesperium? Are they yet another? Uh, undescribed species. Um, I actually did sample these for my next round of sequencing data. And I'll talk about that kind of when I, when I go through the Circeum virginins problem. So for those of you who've never been to the LaSalle Mountains, um, it's comprised of these three major peaks here. Mark and I were up here near Mount, Mount Tuck. And that's where the other uh, thistle is. So the other the LaSalle thistle is all around here, kind of below the mountain peaks. And that's what it looked like from the top. Oh, it was just beautiful. All right. So let's move on to our fish lake thistle, Circeum clavatum. Now, the fish lake thistle has just been a, a taxonomic kind of nightmare. So uh, the fish lake thistle is known from the type locality here in Utah, and then otherwise in the floor of North America, uh, it was treated in this really broad sense and used to encompass a lot of other different species were kind of pushed into uh, Circeum clavatum and given uh, these uh, different varietal names, variety Americanum, which has these really fringed bracts, and then variety Osterhoodii, which has these really densely hairy bracts. But here's variety Clavatum. And I have to thank uh, Andrew for, for taking this photo and posting it on iNaturalist. It was the first photo uh, of uh, Circeum Clavatum from the type locality, and it was, it was pretty cool to see that. So uh, the whole Circeum etonii, Circeum clavatum mess here uh, in the Rocky Mountains really came down to some treatments 
and the, the species that were included in those treatments. So Rydberg back in 1922 actually had it more correct than anyone up to this point. Um, he recognized eight species that in the floor of North America were considered synonymous with Circeum clavatum. And when Harrington came along in 1954, uh, he recognized some of those, uh, but here's where really the problem began. He erroneously included Circeum etonii in the flora of Colorado. And so since 1954, people have been trying to figure out what Circeum etonii is in Colorado. And uh, it's, a, I can tell you that it's created quite a nightmare. <laughs> and uh, the answer is that Circeum etonii is not in Colorado. Haha. <laughs> so it was never here. Uh, and then uh, Weber and Whitman continued to include Circeum etonii. Uh, and then all talk of Circeum uh, centauri, Circeum brisium, any of those others were just, just gone now. So, ah, this, is, this made for quite the mess. Okay, so where, what happened to Circeum clavatum? Well, I can tell you that uh, specimens sampled from uh, near the type locality that correspond morphologically to Circeum clavatum do form a unique evolutionary lineage from all other Circeum clavatum varieties. So we are now going to take those and call them just Circeum clavatum. So now Circeum clavatum is only found in Utah. Uh, the others, uh, the Circeum clavatum uh, that were found here in Colorado, we actually had two different varieties, variety Osterhoodii and variety clavatum, because we didn't, we didn't know what to call, call these things down here. Uh, those actually represent a species described by Rydberg back in 1922 called Circeum grisium. So um, I reinstated Circeum grisium to correspond to these. And morphologically, uh, these are very distinctive. We have bracts that are kind of unequal or subequal here, meaning the bottom ones kind of almost come to the top here, uh, whereas they're clearly imbricate in a true Circeum clavatum. And we have these really spinose margins along the base of the bracts in Circeum clavatum. Now, the ones that we had been calling variety Americanum uh, are another distinct evolutionary lineage that actually correspond to Circeum centauri, uh, which may occur in Utah, and I still have not been able to 100% verify uh, that one specimen. Now, what about these, these others? So I also sampled uh, some clavatums from, from different areas in Utah, um, including down in Iron County. So these two lineages here actually represent those populations down in Iron County. And what, why I have a question mark is because they really aren't resolved at all. So I'm not sure what's going on here. And what I suspect is that these might be part of um, hybrid populations. Uh, there's, there's something very odd going on here. So let, let's go into that a little further. So uh, here's that Circeum clavatum again. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, for these photos. Just fabulous. Um, so this is from the type locality. Okay, so this is Circeum clavatum. Now from Iron County, uh, I thought, well, maybe these actually represent that Circeum clavatum variety Markengatensis uh, that was described by Stanley Welsh. So I took a, a little deeper dive into that. And at the same time that I was looking at these specimens, I, I, I thought to myself, gosh, these look a lot like those Circeum wheeleri variety Salinensi uh, specimen. So I pulled them up side by side and I was like, yeah, I don't know. I think those are the same thing. It's just one has completely uh, glabrous leaves and the other one has tomentose leaves on the underside. And then I looked at the locality for each of these type specimens 
and realized that in fact, these were actually collected at the same place. So that really made me wonder about these things too. So basically what I'm trying to say is there's something really weird going on in Iron County with specimens that correspond to Circeum clavatum. I'm not sure what to call them. I know they're not clavatum and uh, they might be a hybrid with Circeum wheeleri. Maybe that's what's confounding this, um, these results here. And if we take a little closer look at the heads, you can see the bracts of uh, Circeum clavatum here. So this is from the type specimen. And you can see those spinose margins on the involucral bracts, completely absent from the other two uh, specimens, including that uh, variety Marcangentensis. So again, I, I'm not really sure what's going on here. Um, I should mention that I'm actually sitting on a mound of data right now that is uh, not behaving well. It does not want to be analyzed. <laughs> Um, we are having some real, uh, real major issues with uh, assembling the reads using the programs that are out there. Um, so this answer will, or this question will be answered, just not today. And uh, I went to uh, Dixie National Forest, uh, oh gosh, maybe it was three, three years ago now. And so this is my photograph here on the right, comparing those, uh, those clavatums from Iron County to the clavatum from the type locality. And you can see they are uh, clearly very different. And just to, just to give you an idea of what Circeum wheeleri looks like, this is Circeum wheeleri here. It is also very distinctive with its really narrow uh, leaves with these, these widely spaced spines. Uh, and they don't look like Circeum wheeleri either. So I don't know what I don't know what those are. Maybe it's a new species. All right, let's talk Circeum arizonicum. Uh, this is, I think, one of the most charismatic thistles. Um, Circeum arizonicum is pollinated by hummingbirds, and because it's pollinated by hummingbirds, uh, we have this very distinctive uh, kind of uh, red or reddish pink corolla that really uh, the hummingbirds are attracted to. And then the flowers are really, the styles are really ex, exerted from the disc corollas there, uh, again, lending itself to hummingbird pollination. So in the flora of North America, um, David Keel hypothesized that the Circeum arizonicum complex was comprised of five different varieties. So I tested this hypothesis. Um, now these varieties, I should say, uh, all actually have a morphological character of having the corolla lobes at least twice as long as the corolla throat. So it actually made it, uh, it made sense to combine these all together into the same species as different varieties. However, uh, when I uh, kind of produced my phylogeny here, what I found again was that this varietal complex was not one distinct evolutionary lineage and thus not one distinct species. So I first found one that corresponded to Circeum arizonicum. Um, now there is another variety, variety Rothrachii, which was unresolved. So it may correspond to, to uh, Circeum Rothrachii, but I'm still not, not quite sure yet. Uh, and then here's where things get really interesting. So uh, in the Circeum arizonicum complex, it was divided up by whether the flowers were red, uh, meaning that you had either variety arizonicum or variety Rothrachii, or whether the flowers were this kind of purplish uh, color. And the purplish color corresponded to variety bipanatum. Well, what I found is that variety bipanatum itself actually was not one distinct lineage. So we actually had two distinct evolutionary lineages, each corresponding to a different species. We had Circeum calcarium from the southern part of Wyoming in southern Colorado. And then we had Circeum pulchellum, uh, more from the northern part of uh, um, uh, Utah and, and into Colorado there. And morphologically, these are really very similar. Um, they're actually really difficult to tell apart, uh, but they are distinct evolutionary lineages. So they are two different species. And in fact, 
I thought what was really neat when I went through and I, I looked at all of these results was there, there was someone that did a master, maybe a PhD. Anyway, someone did some graduate work on the Circeum Arizonicum complex a long time ago. And they looked at the morphology of this group and every single species that they pulled out as distinct morphologically also corresponded to a distinct evolutionary lineage. So to me that says, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. That means that's good support for these as being uh, distinct species. Now, uh, Circeum chalinci uh, does not occur here. It occurs uh, in Arizona. Uh, and uh, Circeum tenuisectum um, actually occurs only outside of uh, uh, Las Vegas. Here we go. All right, so here's Circeum arizonicum in uh, its distribution. It's really common here along the southern border of Utah. And in fact, I saw tons of it. Um, uh, this is it in Bryce. This is it in Zion. And what's really interesting in Zion is, is this is actually a hanging garden here in the background. And the Circeum Arizonicum is like, oh, I'm out here. I'm not really in your hanging garden community, but, but I'll take this water. I'll take it. And then uh, this is Circeum pulchellum. I took this photo um, in some more calcareous hanging gardens uh, outside of Moab, really dry, gar dry cliff sides here. And then this is Circeum calcare calcarium. I'd like to thank Al Schneider for this photo. I saw his name here today, so it's cool that he's here. And I have not sorted out yet the distribution of Circeum calcarium from Circeum pulchellum. Uh, this, this distribution is basically uh, lumped together, but, but if, if, you know, if we wanna kind of pry it apart, uh, this is basically where calcarium grows and this is pulchellum. Now, it would not be a talk about the hanging or a talk about the thistles of Utah without talking about the hanging garden thistles. Uh, this picture here is actually from my friend Wendy Hodgson down at Desert Botanical Garden. Uh, she has done a lot of work in the thistles of Utah and, and Arizona as well. Um, and this is actually Dark Canyon. So Hanging gardens, for those of you who, who've never been to one, you're like, what, is, what the heck's a hanging garden? Uh, there are these really amazing um, ecosystems that are found all along the Colorado River drainage here uh, on the Colorado Plateau. So uh, it's basically a permanent seep of water. And I, I like to think of them as basically kind of like little islands all the way down the Colorado Plateau ending at the Grand Canyon and starting way up here at Dinosaur National Monument. Now, some hanging gardens are actually pretty easy to get to. This is in uh, Zion, right? tons of people. They're not looking at the plants. I'm looking at the plants. They, I don't think they care. They, they're like, well, this is boring. No, this is super cool. There's really cool plants here. Oh. Now, other hanging gardens are actually not as easy to get to. Uh, this is a uh, dark canyon again. Uh, you know, you want to collect that thistle down there. Um, haha, good luck. That's, that's, that's not easy to get to. Uh, another danger, quote danger, I should say, of hanging gardens is the prevalence of poison ivy. So you see all this poison ivy down here in the bottom corner. Uh, it loves hanging gardens because it's wet. All right, so I'm going to start our journey of hanging garden thistles up in Dinosaur National Monument with Owenby's thistles, Herceum Owenbi. Now this is one that, that I saw uh, firsthand maybe about six years ago now, five or six years ago. Um, I took my son on a little hunting trip for Circeum Owenbi. It was super, super fun. Uh, we had a great time. And one of the things that I noticed when we found Circeum Owenbi was that the spines were actually soft. And I thought that that was really interesting. Like 
like I could brush the the leaves on my hand and it really it didn't hurt at all it, they they were like kind of soft and I thought huh that's that's weird I wonder if that's because you know these thistles occur in these kind of hanging garden uh, habitats maybe they don't really need their spines for protection anymore maybe they're not putting uh, resources into those I I don't know it's just a it's just a just a random thought there yeah. but there it is. There's a little, there's Circe Moenbi, and it's a little hanging garden next to Aquilegia, Micrantha. Uh, it also grows in these kind of sandstone ledges here, basically where, where the water kind of accumulates. And there's its uh, global distribution. It's not a very large global distribution, and it just kind of makes it over the border here into Utah. Now the next hanging garden thistle is probably the most common hanging, well, it is the most common hanging garden thistle in Utah, uh, Rydberg's thistle, Circium Rydbergii. Uh, pictured here with my graduate student, Austin, who also is working on uh, a, a different component of the thistles. So here's Circium Rydbergii. This is actually, uh, you might recognize this. This is uh, just under Corona Arch, right outside of Moab. There's a beautiful, uh, lovely population of Circium Rydbergii there. Uh, here it is again in Dark Canyon. Again, this is from my, my friend, Wendy. Uh, I, I should mention these pictures were taken in the 80s. <laughs> oh, kind of cool. There she is. Tons of Circium rydbergii, and there it is. Now, what another thing that's kind of interesting about all of the hanging garden thistles is that none of the leaves uh, or the bracts actually have hairs on them, so they're all glabrous or glabrous. Um, again, is this a modification of growing in hanging gardens? Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know. And there's the distribution of uh, Circium rydbergii. So uh, I think what's really neat though, so I, again, in this, in this larger uh, sampling set that I, that I have all this data for now, I've got a more extensive sampling of Circium rydbergii from throughout all of these different populations. Um, this one down here in the Grand Canyon probably actually represents a distinct uh, new species that is undescribed. Well, that's cool. Now the last hanging garden thistle oh, is one that is really hard to get to. This is Circium joanne. It's actually only known from two localities in Zion National Park. Um, it's at least a day to get back to these localities. Uh, I have not seen them yet. Uh, I was actually going to try to go in the summer of 2020. So I think we all know uh, what happened to that expedition that kind of fell apart. <laughs> so, so someday, someday I'll go see Circium Joanne. Um, but what's really interesting uh, evolutionarily about Circium Joanne is that it is sister to that high alpine thistle, Circium viperinum. And if you look at the heads, if you look at the bracts, everything about those heads actually looks like Circium viperinum. Um, so, I think that's really, really pretty cool. There's a really neat question there. All right, here we go, Mark. Here's your Circium stereosum. So in the floor of North America, it was hypothesized that um, Circium stereosum was comprised of eight different varieties. Uh, here in Utah, you've got um, most of the variety, varieties that are not endemic to uh, California. So you've got a, got a good mix here of of Scariosum, Coloridensi, Thornae, and Americanum. All right, so again, uh, this varietal complex did not form one distinct evolutionary lineage, and so thus was not one species with many different varieties. So I took all of this data and I took these varieties and I sorted it out. And so we do have Circium Scariosum, uh, these are actually endemic to California, uh, Congdonia invalidum. 
And then here in uh, Utah, you do have Cerceum coloridensi, which has gone under the varietal name of variety coloridensi, but now is elevated to uh, Cerceum coloridensi. And this one is a super distinctive thistle. Uh, it's the dinner plate thistle, uh, variety Americanum, uh, has no stem, uh, all the leaves are basil. Uh, it is now Cerceum tiogam. So these names had actually already been applied to these different species. <coughs> I just had to reinstate them. Now, when I, so I, I should point out here that I actually, you might be like, why do you have two different phylogenies, Jennifer? Uh, well, these are from two different data sets. So this is actually a data set that is just like traditional Sanger sequencing for anyone that, that does molecular work. And this, <coughs> oh, excuse me, is based on a next generation sequencing. So this is what I'm building uh, more of that the, the, the data is not cooperating with. But anyway, just to show you that in the next generation sequencing phylogeny, again, those represent distinct evolutionary lineages. So they are good species. <coughs> oh, excuse me. All right. Uh, I love Cerceum tiogannum. Uh, this is dinner plate thistle. Again, uh, just super distinctive because it has no stem. It's the only acolescent um, thistle. So here is its distribution. It's probably more widespread, but this was based on Cynet records that actually specified variety Americanum. And I'm kind of looking at these California and Oregon specimens now. Now this is Cerceum coloridensi, super widespread throughout the Rocky Mountains. Uh, I think it's actually way more widespread here in Utah. Um, I'll show you why here in just a minute. Uh, and then this is Cerceum scariosum variety thorne, which I think will be elevated to Cerceum thorne. Uh, I just, uh, I just really feel that, um, but I don't have a hundred percent proof yet. Uh, but clearly, it's very different from this Cerceum scariosum, right? That that's really different looking. Okay, so is Cerceum scariosum present in Utah? The answer is yes way up in the, oh, excuse me, the northeastern county, uh, you will see, <coughs> oh, excuse me, two Cerceum scariosum. I think that most of the other variety scariosum specimens in Utah are actually uh, Cerceum coloridensi, tiogannum, or thorny. Mm. Now, what about our virgin thistle, Cerceum virginensi? Uh, this is one that is listed as a G2 status in Utah, so it is a rare thistle of conservation concern. Uh, this is its global distribution here. This is the type locality from near St. George. So we tested this hypothesis. Uh, is Cerceum virginensi a distinct species from Cerceum mohavensi? Because in the floor of North America, these are grouped together. <coughs> so what we found in this data set was that all they, they are sister to each other. They do uh, share a common ancestor, but we do see some very distinct morphological differences. So this is actually the group that my student Austin is working on currently. Um, he did a widespread sampling of Cerceum mojavensi, Cerceum virginensi, and in the Grand Canyon here, actually, let me go back, down here, we actually think that that's actually um, a new species. Cerceum wallopiorum is the proposed name. But uh, what he found was that morphologically, he could separate these. Um, we are still waiting again on the genetic data to be analyzed. Uh, I can hopefully provide you with an update if we ever get the, the data sorted out. It is really a, a nightmare of data. Yeah. 
And here, just in case you're wondering, what does Circium Wallopiorum look like? How is it different? Uh, it's clearly pretty different. It's, got, it's, it's a little tall. It's got some height to it. And it's got these giant basal leaves um, that are like over, over two feet long. It, it's really a remarkable thistle. So in our opinion, based on the morphological work that Austin has done, uh, we do think that Circium virginensi uh, should be recognized as distinct from Circium mojavensi. One of the ways that you can uh, distinguish these is the arrangement of the heads. So in Circium virginensi, the heads are, are much smaller than mojavensi, and they're also in these kind of clustered glomerules, whereas in mojavensi, you usually just kind of see this singular head. Uh, this is the type locality of Circium virginensi here, uh, right outside of St. George. And then this is also a little outside of St. George. It's in a really weird area. It was a spring uh, next to a, a busy roadside. Uh, we stopped to collect uh, the, the thistle here. By the time we got here, it was 109 degrees. And <laughs> My poor student, Austin, oh, he's such a trooper. He's collecting the thistles, but look at his face. He's so tired and hot. Uh, he did a lot of work for this. So. Anyway, uh, my conclusions really uh, are that there needs to be some more work completed on Utah's thistles. While I have answered some of the taxonomic questions, actually many questions still remain. So I've brought up a few of those today. Uh, one of the things that would really help me um, and really help any botanist in um, their taxonomic work are photographs. So I really encourage all of you uh, to make observations and to uh, upload those to iNaturalist. Um, I really use iNaturalist as a tool when I'm analyzing the morphology of a group. It's, it's such an amazing tool. And if you come across a thistle that you're like, wow, this is a weird thistle, you can even tag me at Jay Ackerfield and it'll show up in my feed. So I just wanna encourage you all to uh, make more observations. I've included this little map here of all of the Circium observations uh, on iNaturalist in Utah. So you can see that there are clearly uh, areas where almost no thistle observations have been made. So get on out there. And with that, this will be done. <laughs>